Shine.fm presents Stronger Together, a show about growing in marriage, parenting, relationships, and community. Here's Seth Tower Heard. Stronger Together. Now, normally, if we're talking work and missions, you would say, oh, yeah, either myself or somebody I know, like, you take work off, like, you take vacation time so you can go do a missions trip. And those are, like, two things you could do in your in your life. Andrew Scott's joining me uh, to talk about the fact that maybe you shouldn't be thinking about it like that. Is, is that a good a good way to say Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Well, I'm hoping that we can uh, take a, a new look at what we think about work, what we think about mission. You know, it's interesting uh, on the missions side of things. In the last 10 or 15 years, I feel like a lot of churches and a lot of people have said, okay, so some of the things we were trying weren't working that well. Like they were well-intentioned, but maybe they... Uh, didn't have the best results for spreading the gospel overseas mm-hmm. that you know that we thought they might, and unfortunately, I think that that there has been a little bit of a like the pendulum swung too far the other way. It's like, oh well, if we didn't do it right, let's just not do it anymore. Right, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can yeah. get a little bit back to more just what works. Your book is called Scatter. Take your job with you. You say that like the way we think about work and about missions is not working for 2017 for the kingdom of God. Uh, how do you sum that up? Like, Well, I, I, I think we have lots of statistics. One of the things I've learned uh, or seen when I've come to America is you guys measure everything, and that's wonderful. So when you look at the statistics of how are we doing, lots of amazing things have happened over the last couple of hundred years of a mission endeavor, but the reality is that there are more people in the world today who will live their life without ever hearing of Jesus one time than there were when we started uh, 200 years ago or even 50 or 60 years ago when my organization started. So there are 2.8 billion in the world who we would say will be born, live, and die without ever hearing the gospel one time, and every day 57,000 are being added to that number. So we're going backwards, and that's not okay. So we have to say something is not working. Okay, that blows my mind because— I guess everything I'd heard is like, you know, the Bible's being translated into yep. more languages and there's all these like amazing things going on and, you know, the internet. <laughs> so yeah. it seemed it seemed like actually this was getting getting better. Um, it, actually, if you want to go ahead and just jump in with the, you know, just a, a quick summary of the missions organization and then tell me why, you know, the global church is going backwards here. Mm-hmm. Well, we're a 60-year-old organization actually started by a Moody grad, George Verwer. Operation Mobilization. We're now in 118 countries. Uh, about uh, 105 different nations are in, represented in our membership. Uh, so we, we're uh, a, f- a few thousand people that are out there trying to make a difference in the world, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ in very uh, real practical ways because we believe the gospel has the power to change everything. And so as part of my role as the president of OM here in the USA, uh, just taking a look at this uh, this idea that things are changing in our world. We're not making the progress that we think we have been making. Yes, amazing things are happening. You mentioned it. You know, what Wycliffe are doing and others for the translation of the Bible, exciting. High, high point in uh, the Christian world today, the missions world. They believe that by 2025, everyone will have, or the translation of the scriptures will have started in every major language in the world. Amazing. Church has grown in Latin America, parts of India, parts of China. Yes, all of those things are amazing. But we still have to look at the total picture. And there are more unreached in the world today than when we started as a mission agency uh, by a long shot, almost doubled. And 57,000, as I said, are being added to that number every day. So that's, that's in the midst of the great things, we must understand that the bottom line statistic is not looking good. Okay, so we're going to kind of shift into what do you and I do with this number. But one question before I do that, and that is, so what, I mean, what happened? Has the American church and, you know, kind of the global church just become a lot less interested in spreading the gospel in other places? Or, or you know, why... Why do we fall off? I think a lot of it has to do with our view of mission, and you mentioned it right up at the start, is that I think we have created a dichotomy, and that dichotomy has been here for for centuries, quite frankly, where uh, there th- there's a secular part to our world and there's a sacred part to the world. We delegate the sacred part to a few professionals that we pay to go do the job for us, uh, when really in Scripture we have to understand when we look at Scripture is that actually every follower of Jesus has been given this task. You cannot delegate the purpose of God to somebody else. That was, you were created for the purpose of God. Yeah, I had somebody say to me one time, 
man, you just really seem to have the gift of evangelism. And I, I just, something I didn't know that well. And so I didn't say back what I wanted to say, because it would be <laughs> kind of rude. And I was like, no, I don't have the gift of evangelism, or maybe I do, I don't know. But what I would say is, I actually hang out with people who aren't Christians, which yeah. gives me a chance to share what I mm-hmm. believe. The reason you don't have that opportunity is you don't hang out with anybody who's not a Christian. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another huge issue that we have to realize and recognize and and confess to is that that the church today is mostly known for what happens on Sunday in a concrete box. Right? Mm-hmm. And and ministry happens in that concrete box and 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 we're encouraged to sign up for some form of ministry that happens within that sphere. But really the church the, the church gathered was never designed to be a place where that type of ministry was to take place. The church gathered was a place where you were equipped to go out and do ministry, right? Yeah. And when Paul Paul describes it in Ephesians 4, he said, there's a few of you, he names them who they are, pastors, apostles, preachers, evangelists, etc. You've been given the task to do what? Equip others to do the ministry. So a few were designed to equip the many to do the ministry, Mm-hmm. which would happen out there in the world. The problem is we flip that, and, a f- and, and many show up on a Sunday to watch the few do ministry. Uh, and I think that's a huge part of our issue. We have to, to realize that every one of us has to be involved in living out our life, reflecting the, reflecting the love of Christ in the world. And when every one of us recognizes that, I think we'll start to see a difference in this number of unreached because... Uh, we're not delegating that responsibility to a handful. The many are taking it on. When you talk about that number of people who don't ever hear the gospel, I'm very interested to know, like, how many of those are Americans? Well, because like, it's got to be going up, right? Right. Well, we actually none of very few of those would be count Americans would be counted in this figure. We're talking about parts of the world where people will have no access to a church. Uh, no access to they, they'll they'll never meet another Christian. So places like the Middle East, North Africa, Western Central Asia. Now, of course, some of those folks have moved here. Yeah. So then they would be counted in the number. But even then, that's that 2.8 billion is specifically that group of people. Now, if you look, if you think then or add into that number Americans who never set foot in a church, uh, because of your illustration, nobody hangs out with them that is a believer because we're too busy living inside our concrete boxes. Well, that, you know, that's what's crazy to me is I look at that number that like, you know, something like, how, I believe, you know, I'm just going off memory here, but up to half of non-churchgoers, uh-huh. you know, or people who would say they don't totally know what they believe, yeah. you know, um, would actually go if you ask them. Mm-hmm. And just the thing is, is, you know, we have a, a nation full of Christians that don't do it, mm-hmm. um, which is like kind of our you know, one of our primary things we're supposed to be doing while we're alive yeah, on this earth. Yeah. And I think part of it as well is that we don't, we have made the gospel something, primarily something we speak, and, and, and it hasn't necessarily impacted how we live. And so is there anything attractive in my life that makes somebody want to, to come to the point saying, there's something different about their life and I want that something different? Uh, and and I, I think that we have to understand that the gospel actually is something that I would say even first and foremost is something lived out. Jesus spoke about the kingdom of, of God for three years before he died, laying out a way to live in the world that would separate you out from the world, that would cause the world to see light, that would cause the world to taste salt and say, wow, that, that you in the world makes this world a better place. And, and unfortunately, we have seen the gospel only as something we preach to somebody, and they're not going to listen to us because my life has nothing in it that makes them want to listen to the message I have. And I think if we can understand that and change that thinking, I believe we'll start to see uh, a change in the world. But we have to be in among these people to see that. If you're just joining us, this is Stronger Together. My name is Seth Tower Heard. Andrew Scott joins me. Uh, his new book is called Scatter. I believe the tagline is uh, take your job with you. Go, therefore, and take your job with you. On the missions thing, one of the things that, you know, that unfortunately I think has gotten more people turned off is just the rise of transparency that, you know, that there being so much information online has brought. Uh, and like I said, I, I think it's an overreaction and that a lot of churches were doing short-term missions trips that uh, – were pretty ineffective and, you know, in all likelihood, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like they were, uh, th- there's a comedian named John Christ who 
Um, it, you know, really funny guy. Loves the Lord. He's not like saying this out of bitterness or anything. He's just kind of pointing out the the irony that you know he has a, a like a little bit about you know it's a missions trip or whatever. Well, let's you know let's go to this country and paint the school that got painted last week by the missions team. <laughs> You know, and then have a shopping yeah. day yeah. and then take a bunch of pictures Excellent. with poor people for Sometimes our, our social can... media. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, there have been voices in books written about the fact that uh, sometimes even well-intentioned people have lived for years and years, you know, in foreign countries and brought in all these people from American churches and really not seen any results, not seen, you know, people really hear the gospel. Just mm-hmm. like we tried a bunch of stuff that didn't work yeah. for a long time. And I think that's where a lot of the disconnect comes from, um, you know, in 2017 with like, okay, so what am I supposed to be doing with this missions thing again? Uh, what do you, you know, what what do you say to that? Have you seen that as well? And how do yeah. we correct? Yeah, I think one one of the things, Seth, and without uh, hammering home anything more than you've already said, but I do believe that we've we've uh, in many ways there's been we've shown bad stewardship of finances that's sending a lot of these teams over that is not necessarily making either the difference in the individual who goes or the difference in the community in which they go to. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's many of these trips that have had impact and people's lives have been changed. But I think I think there's a fundamental shift that we have to take see happening. And as a mission leader, this is something that I've had to set back, sit back and think through and be honest and transparent about it. Uh, and that is is that we, when we go into a community overseas, we, we must go in with a credible, authentic presence. You know, we, we, we must go in in such a way that, that uh, there's no suspicion about who we are when we go into that, that, that community, that they understand that we're here to work for the good of the city, that we're here to help them in their, their, their situation. That we, uh, another fundamental shift is understand that, again, the gospel is something that's lived out. Yeah, uh, as well as spoken out. I'm not saying we we shouldn't speak. Absolutely, we need to speak out. But it's something that's lived out, and therefore, uh, that leads me to believe that one of the greatest places of doing mission now, even in this country and overseas, is in the place where people are doing the most of their life. So, for example, the vast majority of people live the vast majority of their life in the marketplace at work. Yeah. So why can the marketplace not become the majority place of mission? where we can live out our life authentically in front of our workmates, showing excellence in what we do, being Daniels, Josephs, Esthers in the world, so that we give people an opportunity to see something different, an alternative worldview. Uh, and, and, and what they're really seeing, actually, is the glory of God reflected through our life. And the glory of God's attractive. And I believe that through uh, living that our, our faith out in the workplace, I don't mean standing on our desk and preaching the gospel. I mean being the best workmate, being the best worker, being excellent what we do, having an attitude that's different, having actions that are different, it will attract people. And I can tell you story after story of people in, in the places of the world that would shock you who are doing that and every day getting opportunities to tell people about the hope that lies within them. Is that something that has just kind of fallen off in the last, you know, couple generations when you, you talk about the sac- sacred secular mm-hmm. divide of like you know i do what i do during the week and then i yeah. show up on sunday and i you know, throw some money in the plate yeah. so i'm yeah. covered <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah. uh and, and then i go back and i do my thing uh, what is that um where where did we lose this like yeah. where did we lose this in the american church like you know talking about this regularly and affirming to people um you know because if you, you got two high school kids that are graduating, right? Uh, and one of them is like, well, I'm going to go be a pastor. He's like, whoa. And the other one's like, I'm going to go be a, uh, an accountant or an engineer. And he's like, okay, that's mm-hmm. that's cool. I mean, you know, that's that's good. Make good living, whatever, right? Um, so we we really do, I, I guess, kind of swoon over certain, yeah. uh, you know, certain things that we think yeah. are more holy, right? Yeah. Like if you're up there yeah. singing a song for yeah. the congregation, yeah, yeah. leading them in worship to God, we think of that as more holy than, um, you know, than somebody who's doing a, a business merger, yeah. right? Or, or whatever your job is, daycare, whatever, yeah. right? So, how, like, where did we lose that, yeah. and how do we get it back? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We, it actually dates back to 308 A.D., believe it or not, to a guy called Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, and this, this is a character who was a big guy in the church, known as the father of church history, and he was a big fan of Greek 
philosophers, Socrates and Plato, who were lived a few years before him. But he introduced into the Christian church, he was a, a, a church leader, into the Christian church, this idea for the first time that there was two lives. There was the sacred life and the secular life. There was, And he called it the permitted life and the perfect life. And I listened to this. He said the perfect life was for set aside for those that were pastors, uh, priests, missionaries, basically. So the, the, the guy that you said people swoon over, wow, look what he's doing, right? And then there's the, 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 the permitted life, uh, and that was res- reserved for everybody else, the farmers, the soldiers, the business guys. And, and he described the one as sort of a heavenly existence and the other one as a second-grade form of piety. In other words, these guys were second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. They, they just didn't make the cut, uh, and so they just live out in the second phase, which we have spent the last what, uh, 1,700 years trying to shake that off. Martin Luther tried to. It's interesting. We're celebrating Reformation Week in the last while. Yeah. Uh, he tried to shake it off. He, he, didn't, he didn't succeed fully. Uh, I would say some of the mission endeavors in the early days, like uh, uh, Adoniram Judson, Mary Slessor, when these folks went into nations, they did live it out more effectively, so much so that when they died, the governments flew the flags at half mass because they had impacted society so much. But in recent years, we have completely lost it, I believe, Seth, we, or, or almost completely lost it. Let me be a little more fair. Uh, and we, we, we honor those that are missionaries and pastors and church leaders, and, and we should. But they simply have a different role in the kingdom of God, not a more important role, just a different role. And everyone is included in the grand purposes of God which is to reflect his glory to the world. And the sooner we can stop delegating the work of the ministry to a few and accept it as all of our roles, then I believe we'll start to see the change in society and see the change in the reality of the least reached, those that have never heard. Wow. Uh, let me throw this at you, okay? By the way, uh, this is Stronger Together, a show on growing in mar- marriage, parenting, relationships, and community, joined by Andrew Scott. We're talking about... Uh, work and missions and how those two things can um, can go together. So I'm kind of an odd extreme case in that I am such an extrovert. Uh, you know, I've been married two years and it took a while for my wife to get used to the fact that like I, I would be on a train and then I'd, I'd call her when I, you know, got off the train. It's like, hey, do you want to go sailing with these this couple? And she's like, well, who are they? I'm like, well, I don't know. They're on a train. They have a sailboat. And she's like, well, how do you know they're not serial killers? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work that one out. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and so, you know, this is an area for me that that comes a lot more naturally. I, I make a lot of connections. Um, you know, this show on Shine.fm is one thing I do with my life. I spend the majority of my, t- of my time running a company mm-hmm. um, in, you know, pretty much the secular world. And so it's very easy for me to make connections. And Oftentimes it's not. It's just being there for questions when people kind of wonder why I'm different, right? And so that's all just been super natural to me. Uh, it's been, a, you know, and there definitely are other areas of, you know, faith that are harder for me, yeah. right? But if somebody's saying, I just don't know what to do with this. Like, how do I walk into my job and do this salt and light thing? Because I've always just thought of this as the place to get money. And then, you know, I take care of my family and I volunteer at church and that's what I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think first and foremost is to understand that if if you're living out who God made you to be, that means that, for example, if you're an engineer if you, and you feel that that's the way God wired you, I mean, there's some people in jobs they hate, right? Actually, quite a few people, according to <laughs> statistics. And I, my encouragement to you is I know you need to get a paycheck at the end of the day, but God uniquely shaped everybody, Right. And I don't have time to go into that, but Ephesians 2.10 tells us that, that we are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, he before he made us, he thought of what he wanted us to do, and he made us accordingly. So he's uniquely shaped everyone. You, obviously, as an extrovert, as someone who is is great at, at doing your job on the radio, running a company, and you're doing what God created. You feel the pleasure of God, like Eric like Liddell, the runner, said, when you do what you do. And And if we're in jobs like that, then then for then embrace that as God's purpose or not purpose for your role his role for your life right and 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 embrace that and go to work with that attitude that's first and foremost and then uh, as Paul says do it as if uh, not onto an earthly master as onto the lord so your attitude is i'm going to work for god every day 
as an accountant, as an engineer. Therefore, I'm going to do it for his glory. So that all of a sudden, your excellence level shoots through the roof, right? Because you're not doing it for money. So that's an attitudinal thing. This is more about motivation than it is about vocation. And then thirdly, uh, you know, being ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. If that is the thing that you're struggling with, then I can assure you that there's you can there's books, there's people, there's your pastor, there's people in your church, there's small group leaders that can help you think through how do I respond when somebody says, "What's different about you?" and and invite somebody into your life to help you do that so that you have that immediate answer when that opportunity come, comes comes your way. Uh, but but don't don't think that it's going to be easy because we live in a world that 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 will challenge those types of thoughts. But it's our role, and we should live it out when the opportunity comes our way. Yeah, and I I do think that there is there's one element that's like whatever you're doing, um, God can use you in something you do hate at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you maybe don't have to spend the rest of your life in a job you just can't stand. You know, there, there's a bumper sticker that's meant to be funny. And every time I've seen it, it just like breaks my heart. You know, it, it says, um, you know, oh, so you hate your job, question mark. Um, there's a support group for that. It's called Everybody We Meet at the Bar. And it's like, you know, it's meant to be comical. And But instead of laughing at that, I've always seen it. I'm like, oh, man, like, you know, God wired you to do something. Yep. And you may not acknowledge him yet but you you still have those gifts talents abilities inside of you and there are very few things that are as frustrating in life as not being able to use those especially if you're a christian the glory of right. god um or just having to like shove those down and ignore them while you do something that god didn't wire you to do yeah I, 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 you know you asked a question earlier on what needs to change i think that's a fundamental that we absolutely have to understand and change we have been created for one purpose one purpose alone, to be in relationship with God, and that relationship comes with a role to reflect what we experience from God back to the world. That's a, a, a truth. And He, God has uniquely shaped us, Ephesians 2.10, to reflect His glory back to the world. So the way you reflect your, His glory back to the world is different from the way I reflect my glory, His glory back to the world. If that's true, true Seth, then it is not acceptable for us as followers of Jesus, as image bearers of God, to live out our life reflecting something that was never supposed to be reflected from our life. And that is some job that was we chose to do to, to, because there was no other option. Now, it may have to work for a while because you're providing for a family, but I would really challenge those that are out there listening to look at your life and understand how did God wire you? And then Spend the next few months looking to see how can I move myself into that because if I keep going to a job that I hate, I'm going to be a grumpy person. It's going to be really hard to change my attitude in a situation. Yeah, if it's if it's one day a week, maybe. But if it's five days a week, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, you're, you're never going to get to that place where you can shine because you're not living the way God wired you to live. Uh, and so I, I think fundamentally we have to embrace this idea. God, you, God made us a certain way, and he made us that way for his purpose, to reflect the glory to the world. Then, therefore, w- let's find out how he made us so we can reflect, be the most brilliant reflection of his glory by living that out. If you're just joining us, my name is Seth Towerherd. Uh, Andrew Scott joins me. The book is called Scatter, Therefore, uh, Go and Take Your Job With You. If you are in a situation where... Um, you know, you just you hate what you do. You kind of felt like you did it because you needed money, and you don't know where to go. You've never heard this before. You've always thought, well, there's you know the spiritual job, there's mm-hmm. the pastor, worship yeah. leader, missionary thing, and then there's just whatever else you make money at. You know, I would recommend that you scrape together, you know, a couple bucks here and there while you can. And there, there are a couple fantastic tests that are either free or cheap. Um, one of them is the Myers Briggs, another one is Strengths Finder, and a third one is called Disc. Uh, and those are going to be somewhere between three and or free and forty dollars each. Yeah. And man, that will give you a picture of how God put you together. And you can take those test results and look at the kinds of things that fit um, somebody that is uniquely wired, just like you are, by your Creator. Mm-hmm. And what you can go do, you know, what you could go do. That first of all, you'd be happier at. Second of all, I guarantee you're going to make more money when you don't hate your life. Uh, and you know, the, the third thing is um, that you're stepping towards something that God wired you for. Uh, as opposed to just like a thing, mm-hmm. man, it's it's crazy to think that like that is not something that we tend to talk about in American yeah. or you know maybe you you're from Northern Ireland maybe yeah. European Christianity yeah. that um, well you you think of we've come out of the builder generation we're we're a few generations from that but the builder yeah. generation where where they had to hunker down and make it work 
and after the, the World War II, and do whatever it took to provide, take whatever it would take to provide for their families. Because uh, most of those guys were off fighting a war when absolutely. they would have been doing job training yeah. that would have given them like a career, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I think we're still living with a residual effect of that. But then you throw in the sacred secular, and you throw in this idea that we're really guilty of as church leaders and mission leaders is that that. Uh, it, that the only thing that's useful inside you is the spiritual gift that the Spirit brings into your life. And, and uh, as I lay out in my book, uh, the acronym that Eric Reese came up with, SHAPE, S-H-A-P-E, God shaped you for his purpose. S is spiritual gifts. H is heart or passion. A is ability. P is personality. And E is experience. God shaped you in all of these ways. Well, in the Christian world, we've said, yeah, keep the spiritual gifts. Everything else is of you. Lay that on the altar and turn it aside. And if you want to step into mission, those abilities you have are not really useful to us. We want you to come do ministry with us. Or, or those passions that you have, they're, they're of the flesh, so leave them aside. Well, if everything was created by him and for him, surely what's inside your life that has been restored and renewed through Christ, Paul tells us, were, were created for his purpose. So pay attention to your passions. What makes you angry? What makes you excited? Because those came from God as well. And as redeemed through Christ, we can use them. So some people are really excited about sport, music, uh, business, engineering, uh, social justice, pay attention to your passions. What makes you angry? What makes you, what, what's the abilities, the natural abilities? N- you know, some people are accountants. Like, don't put me near an accountant. You know, <laughs> I, you, you know I, I, that's why we have accountants. And, 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 and God has given them that ability. Why? Only for one purpose, to reflect his glory back to the world and to allow this world to function. Uh, and, and that's part of our governing the world that he talks about in Genesis 1. I'm going to reach back to a moment when I was 16 years old that was very definitive because I, I think it applies pretty well universally no matter where you're at. Okay, so I was um, really I was a good student and I, I really loved. Uh, I was very involved in school, you know, basketball, yeah. yearbook, yeah. kind of did all the stuff, right? And I applied just because I was like, oh, free college, I should I should shoot for this. I applied for an internship uh, with a bank to where I would come out on the other side being a bank executive, and so. I beat out like 400 other kids and what they wanted for me to do was sign a contract when I was 16 years old that I would stop all school activities and work for them after school. I would go to school for four years and then come back and work for them for another four years. Wow. And I would have been like uh, 26 or something like that by the time it was all said and done. It's like they wanted me to sign 10 years of my life away wow. and I just couldn't do it. And the thing is, is I had the ability to do it but I didn't have the passion. And what ha- wound up happening was because I didn't do that, uh, you know, I moved from a farm to the Chicago area and was on a, um, you know, I was on Shine Dead FM when I was 19 years old. Wow. There you go. And I, I could I could have done the other thing, um, but, I, you know, it it would have killed me even though I had the ability because it, it wasn't what God put in my heart. Yeah. And that, you mentioned strength finders, Marcus Buckingham, and, and, and he talks about uh, the, a strength is not just simply something you're good at. It's, it's where you're, what you're good at and your passions align, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that speaks to what you're, you're saying. So pay attention not just to what you're good at, but what makes you come alive when you do it. And, and in fact, you think, boy, this is, everybody knows how to do this. Surely it comes so easy to you. Uh, and, and lean into those things. Because again, they're not of you. God created that. And he created it for a purpose. And he wants you to live in that so that you can be the most brilliant reflection of his glory by being who he created you to be. Yeah. And, you know, if it seems like God's put something in your heart that's weird um, and people are like, that's that's not a real thing. You need to grow up. I, when I, you know, I grew up on a farm. I don't think anybody would have, if I would have said out loud, just, you know, gone around um, yeah. to adults. I knew. I'm like, by the way, I'm, I'm going to make money watching movies and writing about them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like we are not. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> become a feed salesman. Come on, let's yeah. let's yeah, let's yeah. get a real goal here, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but like God can go way further than you can with what's mm-hmm. in your head, mm-hmm. and you know, if if you really are called into something, it may mm-hmm. take you a while, it, mm-hmm. and there may be a lot of bumps along the road. Um, but to just go to something you're not good at, or go to go to the thing that's safe, um. Man, I mean, you you really may be shutting the door on some huge opportunities of what you mm-hmm. uh, might be able to do for the Lord. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, obviously, if God put it in you, He intended it to be used, and He uh, that we we will be the best at what we could possibly be when we do what God created us to be. This idea that you can be anything you want, 
is is really a load of rubbish. Uh, you can you can try to be anything, but you'll only be you'll only be great at what you were created to do. But there's a lot of scope in that. That's not a restrictor. That's actually yeah. a, a, a breadth. But you know, I, I, I could try as hard as I, I like to be, for example, a professional soccer player. I love soccer, but I, I really don't have the fast twitch muscles to be a good soccer, a really yeah. good soccer player. Uh, so I think we have to stop trying to be some something we want to be and embrace what God made us to be. You know, I'm stepping on some toes here because uh, this story actually, you know, originated in, in the Shine Data from listening area, but there's a pretty famous Disney movie you've probably seen called Rudy, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's about a, a guy that's drastically undersized and spends four years to get into one Notre Dame football game. Uh, and it's like the Disney, like, oh, yeah. look at all his hard work and yeah. his, you know, his faith and his dream. Okay, that's – and, you know, that, that happened, um, you know, within our airwaves in the Chicagoland area, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great story. It's a great movie, but it is a terrible reality because the bottom line is if you're trying to do something that you're weak at that God didn't design you to do, uh, I mean, you know, it might take you a while to learn that. But if you just keep going, you're just banging your head against the wall and you're not in an area where God can use you to the maximum for his purposes. Yeah. Absolutely. Of course, we have to be careful not to allow that to move us to a place where we won't experiment or try new things. Yeah. Uh, but just make sure as you try new things, you've got good friends around you who tell you you, you suck at that or or uh, that you're very self-perceptive and you can pull back and say, you know, I've tried this and I, I'm not good at it. And let's go find the things. Yeah. You know, I mean, having been in media for, I mean, I, I literally grew up in this, right? I was yeah. a teenager and yeah. I was 21 years old by the time I was on, t- you know, on a syndicated TV show for yeah. the first time. I've had so many people that are just sure that um, God is calling them into mm-hmm. music, right? Yeah. And they give me a demo, and I'm like, "Well, you're not good." Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. either God's wrong or you yeah, are, and yeah, God's yeah. perfect. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's true. It's sad that's right across the board. When even when you think of. Uh, what we t- t- typically call the missions world and the church world, how many people have stepped into the pastorate because they, they sense they want to do something for God, and they think, well, if I, I want to serve God, I need to become a pastor. Uh, and and they step into it, and most people can tell that they're going, well, that guy's really not really a preacher, or he's not a teacher, or he's not a pastor, but he's gone there because he feels that's the only way he can serve God. And so... Uh, I see. I think it's a very sad reality in our world that we we people have gone down paths thinking that God gets blamed for it, or we have set a, a framework in place that people feel uh, that they need to follow a certain direction because that's what God's calling them to do. And and again, another fundamental shift, Seth, is that that if you are feeling that, you, and I hope everyone listening to can feel this, is that you feel I I want to serve God with my life. For the vast majority of people, the trajectory of their life will not not then take them to seminary and to become a pastor or what we call a traditional missionary. The trajectory of their life should mean that they go live out their life in the marketplace where God has placed them to be salt and light. And of course, I would love to challenge people to consider going doing that somewhere in the world where God is not known and I, and, and he's not going to appear, be on television or a Bible in their hotel room, or they'll go to work and never meet a believer because there just are no believers in that country. Uh, and I'd love for people to consider, how do I do that? How can I go live out my life? So not as a, an official missionary, it is, I'm going to take this skill set and, you know, for those who are prompted, who are called, yeah. uh, I'm going to move to Switzerland. I'm going to move to Nairobi. I'm going to move to uh, Thailand, yeah. Yeah. and I'm going to be a business person, an accountant, a nurse, a teacher. Uh, because uh, because the gospel isn't going there right yeah. now. Yeah, and that's how, how God has wired me. And as I go, I will reflect his glory, and I will seek to share the gospel with people, disciple them into the kingdom. And and that, believe it or not, I believe is the next phase of mission. Uh, the day of the, the legacy missionary, I believe, is, is over. I think uh, what we're seeing in the world is what we need are just catalytic disciples, people who will be willing for the one, two, three, four people that's around them in their workplace, their neighborhood, to start introducing them to Jesus through Bible studies and inviting them into those discussions. There's not going to be big churches in many of these countries because it's prohibited. Uh, so simply they need to go and say, I, I, I want to make disciples of a few people around me and let that ripple effect go from my life.
Yeah, you know, just as we close out here, um, I mean, just heartbreaking. The, the the country of Nepal, yeah, basically just banned Christian missionaries. Yeah. Uh, but if you just go in and move there and share what yeah. you know Jesus has done for yeah. you, uh, I mean, eighty percent of the countries that we we that we categorize as least reached. I told you, Middle East, North Africa, Western Central Asia, parts of Southern Europe, and and India, China. 80% of those countries, it's illegal to be a missionary and, and incredibly hostile as well in most of them. So we can't go in with missionary visas. We can't go in in covert ways. And quite frankly, I think that day's over too. If, you're, if, if, you're quest- if your presence is questionable in a country, why are you here? What are you doing? You don't go to work every day. You, you, what do you mean you've been studying the language for five years? And I don't want to be disingenuous to people to do that who've gone with a great heart and, and I applaud them and I honor them. But I believe it's time for us to, to find ways to go in to add value in the community in which we exist, to be a credible witness, pre- credible presence and, and and take the jobs in these places and you'll be welcomed. I, I Story after story I could tell you of people in what would we would call the most closed countries in the world that are being welcomed in by these governments, by these employers who are uh, saying, you've got the skills we need to take us to the next level. Well, we know you're a Christian. In fact, they believe everybody from the West is a Christian. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's no problem, as long as we, as you're, you're working for the good of, of our city. And, and, and that's the opportunity, vast opportunities that uh, are out there for us today to go into all the world and live out our lives for the sake of the gospel. Andrew Scott, the book is called Scatter, Go for uh, Therefore and Take Your Job With You. You know, if you're catching this on the radio and you didn't catch all of it, man, this one's a game changer. You can grab this on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts. Just search shine.fm podcasts. That was Stronger Together, a show about growing in marriage, parenting, relationships, and community. Subscribe to the shine.fm podcast to catch every episode of Stronger Together, available on the iTunes podcast app and wherever podcasts are available. 